for the second keynote of the day. It's another keynote by Siemens, and the title is Using Blockchain Technology for Cybersecurity. Our keynote speaker for the afternoon is uh, Prabhakara Kasinatan uh, from Siemens, in short, Prabha, that you know, who you know him already from the challenge, and he will also continue working with you on the challenge. Nevertheless, you will also be super happy to answer your questions to his talk, and it would be great if we have some three, four questions at the end, so you can think already which, uh, which questions you would have for him. Um, Prabha is a research scientist at uh, cybersecurity technology Siemens, at Siemens AG in Munich in Germany. He's working in the field of IoT security since 2012, and uh, he has published in security conferences such as ACM, SIGSEC, and SRX and in IoT conferences such as EWSN and WIMOB. His current research interests include Internet of Things security, blockchain, and cloud security. He works in international and European-funded projects like Cybersecurity for Europe and a comprehensive cyber intelligence framework for collaborative manufacturing systems. So it's a great pleasure to have you today, Prabha, and uh, as usual, for those people joining us via the online media, we have the uh, Slido. So please also ask a lot of questions in the Slido because the presentations are always more interesting when we have some interaction. So now let's uh, look at the trailer of Prabha and then I will hand over to you. Securing distributed and collaborative business processes that involve industrial internal things or services in a cross-organizational context is a challenging task. It becomes even more difficult when the involved parties do not trust each other completely. This keynote presents some real-world use cases where there is a need to enforce cross-organizational business processes without a trusted third party. Great, so yeah, great introduction, and uh, now we're looking forward to your talk, and uh, we are listening to you. Okay, okay thank, thank you for the introduction, Oliver. Uh, can you uh, feed me a quick uh, feedback? Uh, everybody, everybody can hear me? Can hear me? Yes. There? There? It's working perfectly. Okay, then... Great, I'm happy Great. to hear. I'm happy to hear. <laughs> so, um, so um, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity to give a keynote on the topic, on the topic um, um, can blockchain help can securing blockchain Internet, help of Internet of Things or industrial Internet, Internet of Things? Internet of things. And, and also for the great introduction from Oliver, from Oliver I, don't I don't have to introduce, introduce myself, myself again. again. <laughs> Shortly, you can, can call, call me Prabha. And, and in today's, today's talk, talk um, I would, I would like, like to, to present, present um, who we are in the tense from the Siemens department and what kind of applied research we do at Siemens, at least in my department, and finally to answer your questions and answers. So, so we, we are part, part of cybersecurity technology, technology, which is a central research and development department, department for other, other Siemens businesses. businesses. And Within this technology field, this morning, there were two speakers, Santi and Tiago, and they introduced also a similar slide that I have here. We represent, let's say, um, people from all over the world, and we have um, different departments focusing on specific areas in um, different parts of the world, and I, work at security architecture department here in Munich in Germany. And um, I and Tiago uh, are working security lifecycle team. 
And um, in total, we are around 150 cybersecurity experts um, working to improve the cybersecurity resilience within Siemens and to help our businesses. And we have more than 30 years of experience in cybersecurity research and technology consultings. And we are one of the main important standardization driver also in multiple industrial communities. So with this um, introduction, I would like to jump into the keynote organization. And here in this keynote, um, you will hear me about different use cases um, that we are currently tackling as part of the funded project. And uh, therefore I will give you a very brief introduction to um, different funded projects that I'm working and uh, what type of topics they are focusing and what is Siemens doing there. And later on, to present the challenges we, we face in um, addressing those use cases and the requirements coming out of these use cases in terms of security, as well as their relationship between uh, Internet of Things devices. And finally, um, a high level overview of our approach. Uh, and then finally, as a participant, uh, what could you take away from this keynote? So uh, that would be more interesting. Uh, when to use blockchain? Is really blockchain helpful? And uh, I hope we can answer all those questions at the end of the talk. So uh, to start with the use cases, uh, I will just go uh, with a very high level introduction to one of the standard projects. And um, here uh, you see a European Union cybersecurity competence network, which is formed by um, different pilot projects, uh, starting from ICO, Concordia, ARTA, and Cybersecurity for Europe. And European Union's objective uh, as part of Horizon 2020 funding framework uh, was to create these uh, four big cybersecurity projects uh, to create a competence network uh, so that there can be collaboration to enhance the cybersecurity capabilities within the European Union. And you can see here the numbers as quick stats. Um, uh, it's, it has been funded um, quite heavily and uh, more than 60 partners all over uh, from the 26 EU member states are involved. The main idea is to uh, design, test, and demonstrate potential governance structures for the network of competence centers, and as well as uh, to ensure the adequacy and availability of cybersecurity as a whole and training as, as well as a common open standard for other people to use. So here, um, I'm going to give you a use case that Siemens is tackling as part of cybersecurity for Europe. Um, to note, Siemens is also part of Concordia project as well as Cybersecurity for Europe. And I work um, at Siemens for Cybersecurity for Europe. So uh, some key facts about Cybersecurity for Europe. Uh, the funding period started at 2019, will end in July 2022, but it might be extended six more months. And we have uh, 43 partners um, spread along uh, in 22 countries. You can see here a map showing um, the partners come where, where they are coming from and several technology and application elements, uh, for instance, from nine vertical vectors, uh, such as finance, supply chain, healthcare, transportation, marine transportation, and so on are, are being focused in this project. And at, we, at Siemens, we have focused on compliance and accountability in distributed manufacturing. So what does it mean? Um, let's take a look with an example. So, here in the use case one, um, Siemens builds, let's say, uh, big power plants and for different, uh, different regions or countries. Here, before Siemens can really build um, a, compli a compliant power plant based on the regional rules and regulations, uh, there must be a feasibility study conducted. And then there is a sequence of approval flows uh, starting from the internal um, approvals. Um, and then once a feasibility study is really completed, then um, the design can be published by Siemens. And here, there is a certification body involved. It depends on the region. For instance, if it's in Germany, um, an organization like TÜV, um, for instance, TÜV Rhineland usually approves this process. And then uh, it makes sense that, okay, now uh, the design 
has been uh, published as allies to fulfill the requirements and the regulations of a particular country. And then people can build parts uh, required for the power plant. And all this is done so far uh, by a paper trace, meaning PDFs and Excel sheets and design documents are printed perhaps or sent via email. And then uh, this complex process takes place. Once the design is there, um, then the suppliers, for instance, of a part from a power plant um, can actually produce the parts. My PowerPoint has some issues currently, but it works, I'm happy. Um, so once the supplier one produces a part, then from here you could imagine a supply chain where uh, part A to B uh, is produced and then integrated in the supply chain. And overall here, you could see that in the factory floors, uh, different end equip equipment uh, like industrial IoT devices can be used um, to fulfill the process and the design that has been created and also to make sure quality and the provenance of those parts are maintained based on the approval that has been done. So in order to do this, we need data from those devices um, to then manufacture or integrate those parts. So here there is a clear um, mix between different actions are being involved, for instance, Siemens, suppliers, certification bodies, and um, there is always a concern if something bad happens, if uh, there is one party responsible for uh, a defect in a the product, then it is a huge process uh, to understand the root cause analysis and to find really where the problem started. So in order to digitalize this, where uh, there is an interaction between Internet of Things devices and um, there is a, a use case where uh, different organizations are being involved. And of course, when different organizations are being involved, they might have different mutual interests and uh, they might not completely trust each other uh, in, in a way. Uh, and when a product is really a defect, then they always try to maybe find um, issues where uh, they could pass the blame to another person. So how can we avoid all these problems um, is one of the, uh, the challenges. And this is what we do in this project. And um, to give a second example, I would like to highlight the comprehensive cyber intelligence framework that has been created, that is being created uh, for resilient collaborative manufacturing systems. Um, here in this project, um, this abbreviation is called uh, Collapse. Uh, in this project, um, 13 partners all over Europe are being involved and uh, three major industrial partners um, like uh, such as Philips, Renault, and Collins Aerospace are involved and they provide us the use cases and Siemens acts here as a technology provider where we help them to address their use case requirements um, by developing technologies. And in this um, project, the use case focuses on secure remote maintenance via um, an approach that you will be uh, seeing in this talk. So it's called Workflow Driven Security Framework. So um, the talk mainly focuses on this use case from now onwards and uh, to introduce the use case itself, um, I actually have recorded a video together with the uh, colleague that we worked together uh, with Collins Aerospace. And, um, and this, this talk is going to be presented in the upcoming IEEE 2021 conference uh, in Melbourne, Australia, uh, via online. Um, but so here for you, uh, I'm going to give a, a quick um, peek uh, into what is going to be presented there. So with this, um, I play a very short video and I hope you are able to hear that properly. So um, on the right hand side, you see me and David going to play the video now. So you will hear David from now on for next five minutes. Project at both as and technology provider. On this research with my colleague Valerio, uh, talk about um factory that so both uh, as used nowadays so is, uh, uh, used in the and uh, in today the we're going to talk about for factory uh, need regular update 
Teams and configuration changes. Nowadays, providers about the factory need to record the fire. By train the operator, and which comes from the original equipment manufacturer or OEM. Third party manufacturing some concerns about manufacturer. So, by train. Confidentiality and integrity about sensitive or uh, intellectually property relevant data, especially um, about factor. So, by uh, or uh, about uh, uh, sensitive 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 or uh, Definitely. Uh, um, so I speak video now. Do you hear me now? Can you tell me if you can hear me? Yeah, I, I think the video playback didn't somehow work. didn't work perfectly. Um, so I will continue with the talk uh, myself here. Um, yeah, I, I see the point. I think right now uh, it's easier to um, explain it myself, I think. Um, so yeah, let's, let's go ahead. Sorry, Davide. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. Um, so here uh, you're seeing um, the the use case um, where the manufacturer have different concerns. As um, for example, in this case, Collins Aerospace, or even in Siemens, uh, in other factory scenarios, um, they have um, concerns like uh, whenever a third party engineer who wants to um, do a maintenance on devices that are present in our manufacturing floor, um, then the concerns are such as sensitive data and confidentiality information um, available inside the power plant should be protected. And the software integrity, um, for instance, if there is an update uh, by the um, maintenance technician uh, needs to be validated and uh, therefore there should not be any kind of um, malware injection or anything of that sort to get inside our factory network. And from the perspective of the equipment downtime, um, when there is a remote, then uh, the advantage actually that is um, you're able to do it with all operation that is happening in the uh, industrial floor. And finally, uh, also there is a strict compliance process that are involved in each each organization so therefore that also uh, taken care of what but on the other hand uh, let's say from the um, perspective of um, so okay from the perspective of him meaning in this case um, the the engineer who comes uh, into the other organization's plant and provides a technical support they also have uh, obligations or they want to always protect the data of the customer and also they need to be accountable for anything that happens inside the plant and therefore um, the, 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 the technician who's uh, operating inside the plant should have uh, let's say proper certifications so that he or she is able to handle the equipment um, and also minimize the time that is required to fulfill the operation and um, most importantly um technicians uh, are required to fulfill strict defined procedures that the technician should fulfill so here you see the different concerns but both of them are um, 
concerned about different problems. So one is the, the common objective that nobody wants to harm each other, but then again, they want to prove uh, later on that um, the, the OEM did not bring any um, bad stuff like uh, malware. And also later, if there is a malware, then the OEM should be able to convince later uh, that it's not because of them. So how could we mutually solve this problem? And there could be again other organizations who are maintaining, um, who wants to see what is happening uh, from the auditing perspective. So here you see a very high level um, view of the industrial um, floor or the different layers. Uh, you have shop floor, manufacturing floor, and the enterprise. And uh, the shop floor you have industrial machines with sensors. And uh, this is the, um, the, the color pink, you see is the boundaries of the manufacturer. And uh, on the right-hand side, you see a WWW boundary, which means uh, it's outside the uh, boundaries of the manufacturer, which is the internet. And in the internet, you obviously have different companies like OEM who wants to do a remote maintenance. Here, the high-level objective is to enable secure remote maintenance or access to the equipment um, by using the rural process or um, other objectives, uh, which are defined later in details in the paper that will be published. The high-level objectives are, uh, for instance, ability to model and design and enforce the workflows, um, and then access to the services are uh, provided by the, using the least privileged principle, and always logging of these actions are recorded in a mutable way, so that once, um, if there is a problem, if you're able to go back and you should be able to prove that the person X or Y has done this and this steps. And uh, from the system integrity protection perspective, only validated and authorized application can execute. So this means um, there needs to be some kind of formal guarantees um, before we enforce these um, requirements modeled and processed, uh, modeled and executed via the workflows. And um, here you see that um, the different um, flows where uh, data could go uh, from outside the uh, company premises to the inside premises through uh, firewalls and um, how the maintenance request can um, first go into the um, request or the control center in the enterprise level. And then from there, um, later on, once the appropriate uh, permissions are granted, then the access to the end machine is granted. So um, for the proposed approach, uh, have to switch to other presentation. So here you see, um, okay, give me a second. And okay, here we go. So um, now we have learned the use case coming from a real um, industrial scenario, uh, manufacturer, Coolens Aerospace, thanks to them. And thanks to Davide for helping me and um, to present this in this future IoT um, keynote. So if you put that into um, a sequence of steps, then it looks like this. So there's a maintenance technician coming from the OEM and there's a plant manager who would then first approve whether you have proper uh, credentials to operate my machines inside my manufacturing floor and so on. And you see that later on, once you also want to enter into um, the um, different layers of um, the industrial network, then you need to follow a strict uh, workflow or business process. And this is already defined by the plant manufacturer and is provided to the technician. He should obey this, he or she should obey this to really access to the final. And uh, see that, okay, uh, if you do those steps uh, at the end of the day, the properties that you would like to have um, are something like um, we need to have accountable uh, mechanisms such that whenever a technician uh, makes a request, it is, um, it is recorded in an immutable way. And also when the man manager approves it, it is also needs to be uh, recorded in an immutable way. What is immutable? At the end of the day, uh, you should not be able to change the, the data um, without being detected. And if in the general setup, in most of the um, remote maintenance uh, scenarios, the applications and the software solutions that exist may provide most of the security guarantees that we have, but uh, most of them are centralized and controlled by one particular organization, either in this case, uh, the plant manufacturing organization or by the maintenance organization. 
So uh, in this case, um, you are not able to fully guarantee um, that the administrator or the privileges that they have, um, with that they are able to change some details. So here you could already see that there is a need for enforcing a distributed trust. So how can we do this? And uh, this will be the set of challenges and um, how we solve is what we will see now. So, okay, it's little, there's a little bit of delay. Okay, so as we noticed in, in those two use cases, um, we have workflows, uh, a workflow describes a set of tasks that must be done in a particular order. And also we need to make sure that the workflow integrity meaning the guarantee that the workflow is execu executed as described um, must be maintained. But the real catch is basically there are different organizations and um, these are distributed workflows. Part of the workflows are done by a particular organization and part of them are done by another organization. And here, each of these organizations, people might want to say that, hey, I want other organization obeying my rules so that uh, to access my resources. And also at the same time, I want to obey the conditions uh, that I have agreed upon, meaning from the other perspective uh, to access other resources. And they also sometimes have um, a common uh, feeling that they do not want to have a single tr trusted third party who would host this workflow management service. And this is how it is tr traditionally done nowadays uh, to have this nowadays. For instance, for secure and those cases that we have seen, um, having a sing centralized um, centralized um, trusted third party means too much power and you are able to do whatever you want at the end of the day as a, as a maintenance admin of that trusted organization. So how can we do this uh, by protecting also confidential data um, so that you are able to share only um, data that you want to share with other people uh, in a distributed way? So these are the core ideas. And uh, if you break it down, you could then break it down in terms of six uh, different categories. Uh, for instance, from the workflow specification modeling perspective, how can you make sure that the confidentiality aspects can be preserved? And how can we enforce those workflows uh, in a distributed environment? And how do we make sure that interoperable lead is, 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 is taken care of? And also at the end of the day, it should be usable and uh, you might notice that uh, during executing of workflow, there might be errors and how can we recover from those dynamically? And uh, I note there are also IoT devices being used and um, they also play a part on top of human uh, involvement in approvals. At the end of the day, we need to also accountable and uh, mechanism, meaning an audit trail, uh, which then can help us to attract if there is a problem. So um, the approach uh, is based on uh, blockchain as a backend for having a accountability purpose, workflow-driven security framework, uh, which involves certain components um, to help us model and enforce workflows. So we know by merging them both, uh, we are able to get all those properties and solve the challenges. And um, as a hint, this topic was uh, my PhD topic, um, which I defended last year um, with the title Workflow, Our Access Control for Internet of Things. And here in these two youth funded projects, we are extending uh, that approach to solve different use cases. And uh, as it uh, was more generic and it can be used in different use case scenarios. So now uh, you might have a question, so, okay, how, is, how can blockchain help? What, did that, uh, what does it provide? So blockchain is not really Bitcoin, <laughs> uh, it's a different misconception. Um, uh, so blockchain uh, provides, uh, in a sense, decentralized trust, integrity of the data and accountability, and also control. So party do not control everything. And um, just a couple of points. Uh, I don't want to go into the details of how blockchain works, but basically, um, in industrial context, uh, we are talking about permission blockchain networks, meaning in order to participate in a blockchain network, um, there's a consortium of organizations and uh, they form the network and they allow participants so that now it's not completely public, but still um, within the group of those organizations, you can then restrict who has access to a particular set of data and so on. 
And at the end of the day, blockchain uh, is basically a choreography to establish computer science and security principles where there's a cryptographic hash chain as the building blocks uh, where you provide data and they are hashed together using certain hash algorithms. And then whenever um, somebody wants to authorize um, a transaction uh, which contains some data, then they are bound with the cryptographic identities, which are then always provided by public private key pairs. Um, and then for the um, distributed agreement perspective, here we use the distributed consensus peer-to-peer -peer, uh, algorithms um, and, and they provide distributed state replication in terms of uh, practical and in fault tolerant or using crash fault, fault tolerant consensus algorithms. And finally, on the top, um, we have uh, the business logic implementation using smart contracts. Basically, they are code um, that are agreed by different parties uh, before they are deployed into the network. And so that whenever a transaction is being published, um, authorized peers can read um, that this, this transaction is valid meaning not only one organization is able to approve a transaction, multiple organization approve, and the majority is taken into consideration, or it depends on the uh, distributed consensus algorithm. So now we have learned the advantages uh, or learned how blockchain works, but let's also see um, uh, the disadvantages of having a central trusted party. So too much power, as I said before, and inside attackers can go unnoticed uh, by changing or the log data. And, and um, there is a single point of failure. And also, in some sense, um, there's a scalability limitations. But also, on the other hand, there's an advantage where single owner means full control, easy maintenance, and restricted access uh, to users' data. So now coming back to the um, workflow perspective. So I, I talked a lot about workflows, um, but um, now I want to give a quick introduction to uh, a concept pretty old, but uh, still pretty powerful called Petronets. Uh, Petronets are state uh, label state transition system, um, which then has uh, places in places represented as circles and um, transitions represented as rectangles. And here you have uh, as tokens and tokens are represented as circles here and um, they can contain arbitrary information. And basically, uh, with Petronets, you're able to model complex processes and uh, with the reachability analysis and reduction techniques, you're able to quickly validate certain workflow properties. Uh, for instance, uh, if there's a deadlock, you're able to find that uh, if there's um, a place that you want to make sure that it's not reachable because uh, you need to have a protection potential guarantees uh, in the workflow that uh, it's this unsafe state and safe state and so on. And you're able to reach all those, um, validate all those properties uh, such as safety and liveness beforehand and then deploy them. Um, so also they provide uh, features um, such as hierarchical battery nets, um, which that with which you're able to model complex workflows. As you can see now, I, I just did this transition. We, uh, you are able to see uh, here, once I make the transition, these two tokens can be consumed by the transition and provide outputs to the output. So it's very easy for a non-technical user to understand how the workflow works and also to play um, with the workflows. There are a couple of extensive research tools available already, um, and therefore you're able to model and validate those properties uh, by yourself. And there's quite some open source support as well. So now let's see how we can model one particular step using workflow, um, using Petronets in as part of the workflow-driven security framework. So we noticed that there was a maintenance technician makes a request, and here we can man, uh, model the manager on the left-hand side as a place, and the maintenance technician, uh, the approval information can model as a token. You're able to validate certain properties uh, that are encoded in the tokens. And this is how you're able to validate um, that the manager's signature is there or order information coming from the maintenance technician is coming from the authorized list of um, um, OEMs that I approve as a manufacturer and so on. And therefore, as a whole organization perspective, you're able to model them. And if two other um, organizations have their own internal workflows, uh, then they can be merged together uh, with the synchronization concepts. And this is why it's really a good tool uh, for this particular use case or this particular um, general uh, approach where we want to solve these use case problems. 
on high level, uh, you can uh, you can see that uh, not everything can be automated. Um, first, there is a negotiation phase where different organizations just sit together and then uh, design the workflows. What do you want to agree with and what I want to agree with? This process is, is quite complex, cannot be automated, but it can be simplified by using um, activity diagrams, which are easy to understand by everybody. And from the activity diagrams, then you're able to translate them uh, semi-automatically uh, use to Petrinets. And from there, we have developed as part of our research some tools, um, which then are able to develop our, or um, create templates of smart contracts. So, meaning um, by using all the Petrinets validation uh, features, you're able to get the properties that you want to achieve. And once it is satisfied by everyone, then you're able to develop, um, export a smart contract template from there, then you're able to publish the smart contract template and execute them. And for, so we have some tools, um, applications, which, are, which then helps you to um, interact with the real world um, IoT devices, as well as parallelly to call uh, smart contracts. And, and it's the high level um, uh, platform that helps you to achieve those uh, interoperability. So if you put it in the layers, uh, then uh, Petronets are used for modeling the workflows and smart contracts derived from the Petronets are used for enforcing them with the help of blockchain. So at the bottom, uh, there's an immutable um, blockchain network. In this case, we used Hyperledger Fabric, which is a permission blockchain network. And on top of that, as I said, um, from the model Petronets, uh, we derive the smart contracts, which then represent one-to-one -one business logics that has been modeled. And we deploy them in the network. To interact with that, we have the uh, workflow layer, which is the Petrinets workflows. And uh, this can be directly imported into the application that we have developed, which is um, what you see on the right-hand side, which is providing the graphical user interface, um, pretty intuitive, easy to use for the users um, with authentication authorization um, components as part of their organizations that can be integrated. Uh, using standardized protocols like OAP. And from there, you're able to uh, interact with the workflow that you have defined. And the workflows basically trigger um, the smart contracts uh, and the respective smart contracts. For instance, if you're in a step, um, then this steps allows you to uh, query a smart contract, to publish some information. Then at this particular step, you get the right permissions to query the smart contract. And then once you pass the step, based on the least privileged principle, then those permissions revoke for you. Similarly, uh, based on the step that you are in, you're able to access particular uh, services as part of the Internet of Device, Internet of Things, services, or uh, devices. This is how we achieve um, um, the solution. And now you, you see here uh, a sample high-level workflow that has been modeled for the paper that we published uh, in IEEE blockchain. Um, Basically here, um, the workflow starts by uh, initializing and then there are a couple of actors involved. And uh, first, in order to start the request, there must be a device with issues. And then uh, the shop floor technician uh, usually identifies this and makes it okay, here there's a problem. Then we need uh, the next step where we need to create the maintenance order. And this is done by the manager. And from the manager, um, then the request is sent out to a technician who is outside the company. From there, the second approval is there. Once the approvals are granted appropriately, then and finally, in the main page, to uh, access the PLC or any other devices um, through services that are exposed um, in a in a way within the network. And uh, finally, to complete the process, you should have done all these steps in a proper sequence. Therefore, you are able to prove at the end of the day uh, to somebody that you have completed the workflow uh, as it is defined, and then you reach the end state. Um, now you may ask how I could then uh, see this uh, in the application. So the application looks like this. So for two-step scenario, so there is application um, a shop floor technician, device issue, and then approval one maintenance order is there. So the application then consumes the petronets and dynamically changes the state on the information that is available inside the network. And uh, here you see there's a device issue found and the software technician uh, has provided his signature or her signature. And the approval one transition checks that the signature is true. And then here you see SC API, meaning smart contract API, 
calls an approval method inside the smart contract and provides these two input information issues and the signature token uh, as input for the smart contract. And here um, fields where you can enter tokens uh, as a, and here only a user or authorized user at this point in time can provide information. And um, once information is available, then um, the manager or other authorized user are able to fire the transition, meaning move the workflow to the next step. And uh, here you could see that this kind of workflow application can be uh, in, deployed in a parallel uh, in different organizations so they can all work together uh, in a synchronous way. So we will get into the, the deployment now. Um, so we, we uh, look at the architecture now. Let's assume that we have a couple of organizations, um, for instance, manufacturing or OEM organization, and then a compliance monitoring organization, which then look the um, compliance process of how uh, remote maintenance perhaps should be done. And um, as I said, we need um, the most important part is it's not happening between one or two, but more than a couple of organizations. So it's it's cross organizational um, cross organization is involved for executing this workflow. And um, as an um, we have um, the workflow application is uh, installed in the manufacturing um, application and as well as in the OEM organization. And once uh, the application is available and the model workflows are there, then the maintenance technician um, and the shop floor manager or the enterprise manager can download this workflow and then start executing them. So here you see the workflow manager who then pushes this and then make sure that uh, in the IAM he configures who is authorized to execute the workflow. And now you could ask a question, okay, so everybody has their own instance, how they communicate with each other, how do you make sure that the um, state information is synchronized? And exactly, you might now have an answer already. Uh, we use block for this um, to replicate the state in single source of truth to everybody at the same time. And also to make sure that um, when a step is completed, it is also validated by other organizations, um, which has been agreed earlier. So the model workflows is enforced in a distributed way. And at the end, you could see that we are able to uh, satisfy all the properties and the requirements that has been laid down by, by the organization uh, Collins Aerospace. And with, within the context of Collapse project, we are um, developing and experimenting access to edge devices, um, for instance, industrial uh, machines um, through software defined uh, network and firewalls will be then um, then controlled by API driven services. So uh, this is an ongoing project. And um, if you're interested, you're um, invited to look at the paper and also join us in the conference and ask questions. Um, but now already you can ask questions um, at the end of the talk. I think we are close to our end now. Let me see, yeah. So the final takeaways, um, you could then ask, um, can blockchain now help securing IoT devices? So I think um, it depends um, when you have um, certain requirements, uh, such as distributed organizations are involved and uh, there's a lack of centralized trust and you need to enforce certain conditions that are agreed between different organizations. But they, as I said, there is no uh, trusted party that everybody can trust. And you need to have accountability mechanisms. And, and um, at the end of the day, those IoT devices also need to have some kind of tamper-proof hardware so that you are able to establish the trust that the information that is coming from this device is actually coming from this device. If not, then everything can be faked. Uh, whatever is information is inside the blockchain can be still changed uh, uh, because it mimic as a different product. So if you have all those uh, requirements in place and if you have uh, a use case that fits then blockchain fits because usually having them uh, integrated is a complex task and it requires lots of resources than going for a centralized um, workflow management systems. So um, as I said, uh, there are pros and cons again for each and every uh, solution uh, we, we present. Here are the pros. Uh, I think I, I went into the pros quite detailed uh, in the talk. From the um, cons perspective, I think when we Describe PetroNet workflows, uh, they're not always error free by themselves. For instance, if you, from the design phase, make some mistakes, then these errors will also be in the PetroNet workflows and therefore in the smart contracts. So we need to be vigilant on that. 
so that we need to have like a four eyes principle that one person really reviews the workflows that you have designed and before it's being approved and deployed as a smart contract. And um, these workflows can get big and complex. So at some point, I'm, if so many actors are involved, uh, it's, it can get cumbersome to manage. Um, I think it's, it's generally applicable for all scenarios. And um, finally, uh, changes in the business logic means you need to go back to the modeling page, validate all those properties again, and then redeploy it. So it's not as easy as you can do as a code, just open the smart contract and then um, modify some methods or add some methods. Then it means that the workflow logic has changed and there might be some problems uh, which you have missed to validate uh, in the um, workflow modeling stage. So these are some of the time consuming cons, uh, but still provide security guarantees uh, that you want. And um, as a result, um, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to, to present this because now with this work, uh, we have moved from one uh, research phase to uh, validation phase where we are now testing our framework by deploying them in the actual um, laboratories of Collins Aerospace. And we have developed a blueprint architecture which has been presented in the IEEE blockchain paper. And we also made sure um, that we test, uh, we, we wanted to evaluate uh, whether this proposed uh, method works uh, in terms of usability perspectives. So we deployed a um, more realistic network. So one, a uh, couple of nodes in the US and a couple of nodes in the European Union. And then uh, we tried to uh, evaluate how many transactions can be made on this uh, network with the smart contract that we have and with the uh, workflow uh, application layer that we have developed. And we were able to achieve, um, as you can see on the table, 39 transactions per second and uh, as writes and average latency was 0.6 seconds, which is pretty good. And on the reads perspective, it's quite high, 111 transactions. Um, and then uh, 0.17 seconds as an average latency. So this means it is generally applicable for um, generic industrial use cases, but may not, might not be um, sufficient enough for high um, transaction oriented financial use cases. For that, you need to optimize uh, the backend um, databases and do much more optimization on the Hyperledger network. And as a future step, we wanted to uh, extend the approach uh, by, by using uh, trusted execution environments and to make sure that the end-to-end -end, uh, security is achieved and also to formally verify uh, the software guarantees that, um, that was um, required during the requirement space. So that's uh, in, in short about what we do. Um, so the key message here, here is um, Siemens does applied research. And um, thank you really for your attention. Uh, a hint here, as I said, um, more than, we have more than 30 years of experience. And as Santi also mentioned in the earlier call, um, we always look for talented young people. Uh, it could be master students, a master thesis or PhD thesis, or full-time research scientists like me. So these are basically the 17 open positions currently available all around the world. So if you're interested, look at jobs.siemens.com. Um, and those um, eight parts of cybersecurity technology. So uh, thanks a lot for listening. And right now um, I would like to take questions. And this is my contact information if you would like to reach out to me later. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prabha, for the, for the very interesting keynote. Uh, while the audience is uh, preparing for the questions, I ask maybe the first one. So is uh, scalability an issue when using the blockchain? And if so, um, uh, how is it resolved? So uh, in, in terms of um, deploying more nodes and um, creating um, more computational power, um, it's not an issue, but it depends on the uh, logic that you want to implement. So if you, uh, because it depends on the blockchain platform that you use. So if, for instance, in Hyperledger Fabric, um, it depends on the endorsement policies. For instance, if a transaction is true, then um, you have to define how many endorsements you need. And if you scale it up, then uh, this will have a direct impact in the transaction throughput. 
So really you can play around with this configuration and it depends on your use case. So it's not easy to say a generic answer. But for our use case, it fits. Who has a question? Fabian. <laughs> Ah, we have slide of questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, then uh, I can. So one of the anonymous questions is from Dr. Ryan then. Uh, but anyway, first one, which kind of blockchain are you using? In parentheses, IOTA. I think there's an example. Yep. So, so um, um, I, I think I, I, I think mentioned, I mentioned it. it. Um, so, um, so in this in this particular, particular use case, use case, um, we use um, high, we pledge, use of high pledge of fabric as a permission, as a blockchain, permission blockchain system system, or, uh, or um, that we uh, use with this this use case to solve the problem. Does this answer your question? So IOTA is another one. Uh, we use high pledge of fabric. Uh, the second question. Is, So the question was, what is the benefit of using Hyperledger Fabric? Can you, can you repeat the what question? Is the, what, is the, what is the benefit of using Hyperledger Fabric? So a um, couple of advantages uh, from the industrial context, um, you have a permission network. So as a, as a consortium in the beginning, you are able to uh, onboard certain group of people um, and you can extend this or use a number of organizations. So here, first of all, you restrict the amount of people having access to your information. And within these organizations that are part of the high pleasure fabric network, there are a couple of enterprise grade features that usually we need. Uh, in terms of uh, restricting the confidentiality of, of information uh, as much as possible. So there are channels where uh, a subset of um, organizations that are of the network are allowed to, to be part of a channel. And within these channels, you have also other concepts such as um, private data collections where you store confidential information off chain, meaning it's not all part of the public, not really public, let's say in the channel um, blockchain network, but you still have uh, an off-chain database where you actually provide the data and then just provide for accountability information, um, the hash of the data, for instance, on the blockchain. And, and much more. So for instance, uh, High Pleasure Fabric um, allows you to program in different programming languages. So it brings much more um, flexibility, but if you want to look at the details of why uh, high pleasure fabric is better, then um, I would recommend to read a couple of our research and as well as their documentation page. Let's go to the next question. Um, is there a real application of a blockchain in practice at Siemens? Uh, in practice or at Siemens? If not, when do you see the first real blockchain application at Siemens? Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, <laughs> so that's a very interesting question, first of all. Um, so to answer this, um, it's, it's difficult to answer all the details that's happening inside Siemens as a whole, but um, what I could offer you is to look at our um, Siemens website and look for um, C Green. Um, as a product uh, which is being piloted now and will be released soon. Seagreen um, is, a, is a product coming from Siemens to track carbon footprint um, between organizations in the supply chain. And uh, we use a kind of blockchain, um, but all these details will be available uh, when it is released openly to the public. I can only give the information that is already existing on the Siemens website and um, as part of the first release. This, answers, hope this your answers your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is the following. I think this is the last question. Uh, actually, it has two questions. How are, I think it should be how is, 
IoT communicating with the smart contracts and how are they securing the channel of communication between them? That's a very good question. Um, so I, I did know uh, in the talk that IoT devices are directly communicating with the the the, the smart contracts. It can, um, but in our approach right now, we have our um, orchestration layer, which is the Petronet's workflow layer, and the Petronet's orchestration layer communicates with the IoT device, for instance, and then provides information back to the smart contracts in different steps. Um, but can also be programmed in a way that uh, contracts can query the information, then it means uh, we need to make sure lots of communication um, channels are opened and these IoT devices needs to be, um, needs to talk to, to, to the smart contract methods and so on. So you could do in theory, but in this uh, version of the development, we did not do this. Um, we don't have any questions in the slido. Let me check once again among the audience. Do we have any questions? Yeah, then I hand over back to Professor Paul. So your, your question is, in the whole process, uh, the step that I showed, which is the most complex part, correct? Exactly, exactly, yes. So, um, so getting the requirements from the partners and modeling them, it's a time-consuming part, as well as um, once you have the, the requirements and the modeling and the requirements are being satisfied, later on, um, the next complex part from our research was to also um, bring up this blockchain network between cross organizations. So in this case, uh, if there are a couple of different organizations, then to onboard the network and uh, the maintenance, let's say, uh, of the network also is quite some tedious. Uh, technically speaking, the first phase uh, is, the, is the complex one, but the second one is more development DevOps uh, complexity. Thank you very much. And Akin has another question from the chat. I think this is also a follow-up uh, from the previous question. Is the communication intercepted by a man in the middle, man in the middle, potentially dangerous? You're right. So um, there is always a possibility. Uh, for having a man in the middle if it's uh, communicating over the internet. And uh, for this reason, we need to always make sure that the endpoints talk with each other securely. For instance, you could use TLS or other uh, communication protocols based on your infrastructure and the legacy devices as you have. Um, you need to make sure that the communication between um, different microservices as I call it, um, need to be protected. Yes, this is important. And um, as I said, we don't also want to have um, software level protection. This is why I said at the end of the, the talk, in the future, we also make, want to make sure that really uh, we want to use end to end security in the sense, meaning uh, from IoT level uh, using trusted execution environments as well. Very good. Um, so if there are no more questions, let's thank Prava once again with a warm applause. Good, and 